like what you see here? Then be sure to subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8, a channel devoted to the history of college football. New videos drop twice a week. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to subscribe now. And now, on with our feature presentation. What's one of the greatest joys of life in the eyes of a ton of people? Well, they'll tell you that it's the day they welcomed the child into the world. It's the day that they became a father, or if they already had a kid, became a father to another kid, and got to love someone unconditionally for the rest of their life. And obviously, it's a monumental occasion. You have to be there for the birth of your kid. For most people, the thought of missing the birth of their kid for anything seems unfathomable, and everyone is pretty understanding of that. Even the most heartless boss will let you off of work if you get the call that you're about to become a father. And we've seen plenty of athletes miss games and miss practice and whatnot because they had to be at the hospital to be with their wife to see the birth of their kid. Well, this player right here is Chicago Cubs star Jody Davis. And in 1985, he got the news that would change his life forever in all the best ways. Except for the fact that the Chicago Cubs, his employer, didn't quite seem to see it that way, leading to a massive controversy, a feud between Davis and the organization, and a move that, at the end of the day, made the Cubs look like incredible jerks and like the worst organization in the world. Imagine punishing a player for being there for the birth of his child. Well, in 1985, let's just say that the Cubs did that. Because this is the story behind what has to be, considering the circumstances, the worst and stupidest punishment in the way more than century-long history of the Chicago Cubs organization. Before I talk about the incident at hand and the punishments all out by the Cubs, we need some context to understand just who Jody Davis was, and what the original plan was for Davis. During the mid-80s, if you ask people who the best catcher in the National League was, odds are, you get quite a few people that would say it was the man you've been watching this whole time, none other than Jody Davis. A big reason why the Cubs won the NL East in 1984 and were playing playoff baseball for the first time since 1945, nearly 40 years ago, was because of how good Davis was behind the plate and with his bat. During that 1984 season, he was third on the team in home runs and an RBI, was named an All-Star for the first time in his career, and got some votes for NL MVP. Over the previous two seasons, Davis had 43 home runs and 178 runs batted in while hitting 263. So he was hoping to pick up right where he left off for 1985. Now, it wasn't quite working out that way at first, as the Cubs were noticeably worse in 1985 than they were in 1984. And Davis was not exactly having a repeat of what he did the previous year, as he was hitting just 232, and his general manager, Dallas Green, pulled no punches by flat out saying that the team was horrible and lousy, and that part of that was because they hadn't had a good year out of Jody. However, even though Davis was by no means the catcher that he was in 1984, a good chunk of that can be somewhat understandable. Turns out, up until the All-Star break or so, his numbers were right in line with what he was hitting in 1984, as through July 9th, halfway through the season, he was hitting 265, which was actually a better batting average than he had the previous year. It was really just the last month that he was struggling, as after that game until August 5th, he was hitting just 136 with 11 hits in 22 games started. Yes, that was bad. There is no way to sugarcoat it. That's way below the Mendoza line. However, this month-long slump was somewhat understandable when he realized what was about to take place in Davis's life that maybe took his mind off of baseball for a bit and made him a bit nervous. Because at any day now, 
Davis was about to get the call and was about to become a father. This was going to be the third child that his wife, Pam, had given birth to. As Davis said, our first child, Justin, was born during the last baseball strike in 1981. And after the Cubs played a four-game series against the Mets, Davis got the news that he had been waiting for. Pam was due this week, and the baby was due on August 9th. With that in mind, Davis did what any good father would do, and he left the Cubs to return home to Georgia, where he lived his whole life before going to the Cubs. Seeing as he was born in Gainesville, went to high school in Gainesville, and went to college at Middle Georgia State University, where he would rejoin his wife and be there to support her as she was going through the final stages of her pregnancy. He wasn't going to miss this for the world, and understandably so. The baby was due on August 9th, but on August 7th, Pam officially gave birth to her third child, a boy named Jeremy. Everything went smoothly with the birth, and Jeremy was healthy. All in all, it was an incredible moment for Jody to welcome another son into the world. And shortly after the birth, manager Jim Fry called up Davis to check how everything was going. As for what Fry had to say, at least from everything I could tell, there were no congratulations or anything along those lines. Instead, all we got was Fry telling Davis, I expect you to be here. Now that the baby was born, it was time for Davis to return to the team. And Davis had every intention of returning to the team. That was in no way whatsoever an issue here. He was going to miss time to see the birth of his child and to be there for his wife. And once that was done, and she was safe, he would return to playing baseball for the final two months of the season. However, Davis was intending on flying out that Thursday, one day after the birth of his child, and was going to fly out that afternoon on the first flight available that day to join the team in St. Louis. As for what Fry said, he said that wasn't good enough. Don't be late for this game we've got. You have a contract. You're a ball player. You owe it to your teammates and to this organization. We need you. Remember, the baby was due August 9th, so the Cubs were expecting him to be out for a week. The baby was premature by two days, so why they were upset about the baby being born early, meaning he'll still play more games than anticipated for them when all is said and done, I'm not entirely sure. But that's what was going on. Davis initially planned on joining the team in New York for the series against the Mets since that's when the baby was supposed to be born. But he changed his flight to get to St. Louis once plans changed. And yet, in the eyes of Fry, that still wasn't enough. If he wasn't in St. Louis in time for the game, which was supposed to start at 7.30, he was going to be punished. Sure enough, because Davis is not a miracle worker who can bend the space-time continuum and who doesn't have a portal, he only arrived in St. Louis sometime around 7 o'clock, 30 minutes before the game against the Cardinals was going to start. He'd be able to make it to the game, but no chance was he going to make it on time. Obviously, seeing as he missed out on batting practice, and warm-ups, and stretches, and all of that fun stuff. So when Davis arrived, Fry, in his incredibly cold-hearted mindset, stuck him with a $400 fine, just $100 off the maximum that could be given. That's right. For arriving at the game late, due to the birth of his child in another state, even though he wasn't even supposed to be working this day if the baby arrived on its due date, Davis was hit with a $400 fine, which comes out to about a $1,200 fine today. Obviously, this fine isn't backbreaking by any means. He's an all-star player and made about $550,000 during the 1985 season. And that's before other things like endorsements are taken into account. So this fine 
was only 0.07% of his annual salary. It's the equivalent of the average American today being fined 39 bucks. You obviously hate to lose that money, but it's not gonna make or break you. And people have blown under 40 bucks without even thinking twice about it. But it's the principle behind this whole thing. And just the idea that you're going to take someone's money for doing this and for having the audacity to be there for the birth of his child and then not show up on time one day later even though he tried to get a flight and it couldn't land in time and even though he wasn't even supposed to be working on this day i talked about a similar situation occurring on my nfl channel which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner and it's just amazing in all the worst ways that these managers forget that these people are human Davis took it all in stride, and even joked about the matter, but you could tell that he was angry about the whole thing. Said Davis, My boy was only one day old, and already, he cost me 400 bucks. I suggested just going straight to New York for the series starting Friday night, but he wanted me in St. Louis. I don't agree with the fine, but what can you do? Oh, and for the record, they really needed Davis that night in St. Louis, seeing as they lost 8 nothing, and Davis made one appearance off the bench late as a pinch hitter with the game completely and utterly out of reach. Sometimes, common sense has to take over, and this is one of those situations where that absolutely 100% applies. If someone is attending the birth of their child, guess what? That takes priority over whatever the heck is going on at your workplace. If Davis was in St. Louis on that day on time, seeing as he played in just under 1,100 games over his major league career and played in just under 1,000 games for the Cubs, I guarantee you that today, he wouldn't remember a thing about how he did. All the games just blend in with each other. But you know what he would remember? and what his wife and his family would remember? Not being there for the birth of his own kid. Jim Fry obviously had his moments as a manager. He guided the Cubs to the playoffs in 1984, and guided the Kansas City Royals to the World Series in 1980. But this was not one of his finest moments. Not at all. Because in his eyes, being there for the birth of your child was not a priceless moment. Rather, it was a moment that was going to set you back 400 bucks. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, Subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.